Although my last name is Bone, my dad's side of the family has no records reaching further than my grandpa, Richard Bone. We do know that his parents migrated from Poland during the First World War, and that our last name was changed from Ganat to Bone in order to avoid discrimination in America. Richard Bone was born in 1933 in Tacoma, Washington. As a child, he remembers having to wear cardboard shoes to school because his family had no money due to the Depression. After high school, my grandpa was drafted into the Korean War. He served as a radio communicator in Alaska, and his job was to watch for the incoming regs. After serving for two years, he moved back to Seattle where he met my grandma, Beverly Rhodes. These two had three children, my Uncle Ron, my dad Craig, and my Uncle Ken. My dad grew up with his family in Seattle, Washington, and after graduating high school, attended WSU for four years. After graduating college, he moved to California where he met my mother while he was studying to be a biochemist. After discovering he hated biochemistry, my dad decided to apply for medical school and was accepted into the University of Washington. After medical school, my dad joined the Army for a specialty training where he learned to become an orthopedic surgeon. During his time in the military, he recalls traveling all over Europe and the Middle East, visiting the Soviet Union before and after its collapse in many other Third World countries. In 1990, my father married my mother, Deborah Dixon. Six years later, my mother gave birth to me in 1996, and in 1998, my brother Jared was born. Despite not knowing anything past my grandpa on the bone side of the family, my mother's side of the family tracks back nearly 200 years to Samuel Flake, who, in 1720, left Ireland for the British colonies in America. During this time in Britain, the enclosure movement was at its peak, causing many squatters or rural farmers to be removed from their land and forced to find work elsewhere. Samuel Flake was a part of one of these unfortunate families. His family landed in Charleston, North Carolina, where he continued the practice of farming, which was common for most European immigrants. His early life has been lost from records, but we do know that he had six boys and three girls and died in 1802. Shortly before his death, Samuel Flake was able to create a will which has been carried on from generation to generation in my family. His will goes as such. My last will and testament and manner following. Item I give and devise to my wife, Allie, all butter, potatoes, and household furniture. Also my stock of horses and cattle and hogs and three Negro boys, Joe, Tom, and Abraham. All which estate it is my will and desire, my wife Allie and Elijah Flake, my youngest son, my peaceable possesses, and enjoy for their own use in during her natural life or widowhood, and at my decease it is my will and desire that the above property to be equally decided, share and share, about except my youngest son Elijah Flake, who now lives with his mother. Samuel Flake will continue on to state that the majority of his property is to be equally divided among his boys, and that his three daughters will receive only one dollar each. Samuel Flake faced his death in 1802. Sadly, most of his children have been lost to record except two of his sons, Jordan and Elijah, who reached adulthood and were able to pass on the name Flake. These two individuals also provided names my family has passed on, mine being Jordan and my brother's middle name being Elijah. Unfortunately, Jordan Flake died soon after having a child, and his records have thus been forgotten thereafter. Elijah Flake was born in 1788 in Charleston, North Carolina, and was 14 when his father, my sixth great-grandpa, Samuel Flake, died. Elijah Flake was extremely wealthy, owning over 26 slaves valued at $14,700 alone, equal to over $450,000 today. Alongside this, Elijah Flake owned a very large plantation. The exact size is unknown. After raising several children, Elijah Flake died, causing his property to be equally split among his surviving children. One of his sons, Dudley Flake, my fourth great-grandpa, moved to Tennessee in 1854 with his wife, The most Cynthia. plausible reason for this family to move was to allow them to be further away from the abolitionist North, who threatened their way of life. When moving to Tennessee, Dudley purchased 640 acres of land for $2,000. This land is still in the family today and is the site of a Civil War skirmish, the Battle of Parker's Crossroad. Here, General Forrest's men and the horses camped on the Flake home site. The Union soldiers confiscated the corn from the barn to feed their horses. The soldiers also slaughtered all the Flake's hogs, and the Flake's, who are Confederates, fed the Union men in an attempt to not be recognized as Yankees. Dudley, who lived until 1855, had eight boys. Each boy except James Millard Flake fought in the Civil War for the Confederate South, and all seven perished in battle at unknown locations. 
James Millard Flake, my third great-grandpa, was born in 1849 and was only 12 at the beginning of the Civil War, which is why he was unable to fight alongside his brothers. Information on James Millard Flake is lacking because his records were destroyed and lost during the Civil War and during the Reconstruction of the With South. the emancipation of the slaves following the Civil War, our family lost most of its wealth. This reduced us from large plantation owners to sharecroppers who rented the land out to the newly freed slaves. During Reconstruction, Dudley married Winnie Elizabeth Key and had several children. Most of his children are also lost to record except his daughter, Rosie Mae Flake, who was born in 1881 and lived until 1974. Rosie Mae Flake, my great-great-grandmother, married Rufus Ross. Thus, the family name changed from Flake to Ross. Nearly 100 years earlier, Betsy Ross, who was Rufus Ross's third great-grandmother, created the American flag. This means that Betsy Ross is my fifth great-grandmother on my great-grandfather's side. Rosie and Rufus Ross lived up their lives as farmers and sharecroppers on the same piece of Tennessee land and owned a multi-million dollar clay pit which is still in the family today and in the possession of my great aunt. The value of this clay pit was unknown until the middle of the 20th century and caused a large amount of fighting and grief between my great grandparents. Rosie and Rufus had one child, Bertie H. Ross, who lived from 1906 to 2006. Bertie Ross is my great-grandma and married Wiley J. Hood, my great-grandfather. My great-grandmother was a stay-at-home mom who took care of the house and the farm when needed. During World War II and the Korean War, she left her job as a homemaker and helped support the war effort. She did this by working in an ammunition factory during each war. My great-grandfather was unable to fight during these two wars due to his age. He was too young for World War I and too old for the Korean War. He worked as a farmer for his entire life, using the same land that was purchased by Dudley Flake. My great-grandparents had two children, Clarice Ross and Wiley Maryland Ross. Wiley Maryland Ross is my grandma and was named after her father because he had desperately wanted a son. She now goes by the name Maryland. Maryland Ross was born in 1936 and is now living in San Diego, California. She married George Leonard Dixon, and once again the family name changed from Ross to Dixon. My grandma grew up on a farm, as did the last four generations of her family. In January 1946, her house burnt down, destroying most of the family pictures and records of her and her parents. As I interviewed my grandma, she could vividly remember being at school and seeing a large smoke cloud in the distance. Her and her classmates made jokes about the smoke and what was causing it. After school, instead of walking home, close family friends brought her to their house where her sister, mother, and father were to stay until they could rebuild their home. My grandma could also remember being with her best friend during World War II and overhearing about a letter that had reported her friend's uncle's death in Italy. Following this news, the entire community came together and held a service for their deceased uncle. After high school, my grandma attended college for one year and then decided to drop out after meeting my grandpa. Both my grandma and grandpa are stark Republicans and agree that Ronald Reagan was their most cherished political leader. My grandpa served in the United States Air Force for nine years. During this time, he was stationed in California and then in Guam and then back in California. After retiring from the Air Force, my grandpa created a taxi cab business which he held onto for 20 years until... While stationed in California for the first time, my grandpa and grandma had two children, my mom, Deborah Dixon, and my uncle, Doug Dixon. These two were able to live in Guam for two years and have only one memory, squashing giant toads with buckets by putting them on the middle of the toad's body and then jumping on the bucket. After being transferred back to San Diego, George and Maryland had one more child, my Aunt Dana. When I asked my mom about her childhood, the first thing she could remember was having scarlet fever as a young girl. Although this didn't cause any immediate damage, it eventually forced her to have one of her heart valves replaced with a pig valve and open heart surgery in 2004. Despite the failure of one of her heart valves, my mom has been able to enjoy everything life has to offer. In high school, she was a state champion in the 50, 100, and 400 meter dash and a junior Olympic judo competitor. Although my family's name has changed several times, the identity of who my family is and where we come from will forever have a lasting impression on my life. The process of researching and discovering about my ancestors has allowed me to have a greater self-identity and shows me how my family has affected history.